All right, I am Rachel Woody. It is August 1st. I'm here with Mark and Mike Wisnowski at Valley View Winery. And my first question for you guys is, tell us about your origins. How did you get into wine? Okay, I'll start. Uh, our parents came here in 1971 from the East Coast, and my, my father, or our father, had a dream of growing wine grapes, and we had lived uh, all over the U.S. and doing, uh, my dad did heavy construction, and uh, just decided to come to Southern Oregon. He had, we had been in um, Marin County in the early, mid-60s. We worked on a, uh, the BART project there and got sort of excited about what they're doing in Napa and Sonoma, but kind of already thought that it was a little bit done, so wanted to try a new area, which this was certainly was a new area. Uh, when we came in, in 1971, he spent a few months looking around, found this site out in the Applegate Valley, and in 1972, we planted the first 12 acres of grapes. Uh, at that time, it was, it was pretty much the first commercial wine vineyard in uh, Jackson County, south of, of, um, of Roseburg, uh, since Prohibition. In 1976, uh, we, or actually about 1975, he started the plans for what he uh, was going to be a co-op winery, which with about four or five other local uh, vineyard growers at that time. Didn't really work out. Um, so in 1976, we uh, became bonded as Valley View Winery, which became the first uh, bonded winery in Jackson County. Um, and started making our wine. Uh, our first two vintages, 1976 and 77, were made by Bill Fuller at Twalton Winery up in, up in the Willamette Valley. And in 78, we made our first wine here. Uh, it was all from our fruit as well. And um, 1980, our dad died in a construction accident. So our mother took over for a few years, uh, kept it going until our older brother, Robert, uh, graduated college in 85 at which time we also hired uh, our current winemaker, whose uh, name is John Guerrero. We graduated Davis uh, right when we hired him. He's been with us since 1985. Um, I joined, uh, came back from college in 80, uh, right about 1987, and ran it with my uh, older brother, Robert, till 1990 when, when he left, and um, Michael came in 91, and we've been doing it uh, ever since, the two of us and our winemaker. Um, as well as several other people. So that's, that's a quick little nutshell of, of the history of Valley View. <laughs> so Valley View, of course, I believe that was Peter Britt's right. name as well. When, when our parents came and started doing some research about grape growing, obviously there, had, um, there was really no commercial wineries here. There was less than a dozen in all of, of Oregon. And so you know, aside from just looking at whether grapes could grow here, he started doing a lot of history and discovered that this was a major wine growing region back in the 1850s all the way to Prohibition. In fact, Jacksonville had five wineries uh, at one time. The first winery was started by Peter Bread, who was uh, sort of a renaissance man here and, and did a lot of, you know, he was a, he was a commercial photographer, took the first picture of Crater Lake, uh, brought pears to the valley, brought a lot of, uh, of um, plants um, that a lot of people think are native and um, took a lot of pictures and uh, you know, made, made a fair amount of money, so it had a big impact. And he also started uh, the first winery, not just in Oregon, the first winery in the Northwest, and he called it Valley View. Um, it went till his death in 1906, at, at what, what point, by all accounts, it was a pretty successful winery and vineyard. He had vineyards throughout Jacksonville. In fact, on the Bread Hill right now where the music festival is, is where his house was, and he had vineyards there as well. Um, so when we when when we discovered all that history, you know, the, the, we didn't really have any relatives. The name obviously wasn't trademarked, so we decided to honor that legacy. Um, at that point, very few people knew about that, and we've sort of made it one of our missions to really, uh, you know, give give credit to what he did and what those really early vintners did. And now it's pretty common that people know that Peter Britt was the first vineyard vintner, and that the wine industry in the Northwest, certainly in Oregon, started here in. Um, in Jacksonville. So our first two vintages were a virtual exact replica of the label that Peter Britt used back in the uh, 19th century. Um, and we continue to use that label, which we call the Pioneer label, on sort of uh, historically significant uh, vintages and, and wines. So we bring it back every few years just to keep that story alive. Was it both of your parents that worked in the vineyard and got the winery going? Or was it mostly your father? It was mostly my dad's idea. My mom came, you know, we had, a, I, as she would say, we had a pretty good life living on the East Coast, and then uh, 
he had this crazy idea of starting a vineyard in Oregon. And uh, but uh, but now she came and she she loves living here. Um, she she travels quite a bit now, but she always loves coming back and staying here. And uh, and we worked. Um, I when we came here. I was four, um, and Mark would have been eight. Um, and we would help a little bit, even you know back even when we were ten and twelve years old, started doing some things around the vineyard and things like that. So um, and it worked worked pretty much uh, all facets of the, of the winery. That was going to be my next question was, what was it like growing up, life on the vineyard, and did that persuade you to then get into the family business, or? I, n none of the four kids, I think, really wanted to get into the business or were necessarily expect, we were never really sort of expected to get into the business. We always sort of said, do your own thing. If you want to come back, or you want to do it, that's fine. Um, our older sister, uh, you know, didn't didn't uh, choose to do it. Um, Robert, our older brother, did it for for a while and really important time in the in the development of the winery. <clears throat> and then um, I think each of us sort of felt the same way, you know, sort of okay, we'll do it for a little while. And you know, when you're here, you realize you know, it's it's a pretty interesting career. Uh, you can get involved in the, the growing of the grapes. You obviously get to live in a very pretty area. Uh, most people live in the country and work in the city, and we do the opposite. Uh, you get to meet a lot of interesting people. Every year is a little different. You can have, uh, you know, you can get involved in sales or winemaking or grape growing or uh, lots of different aspects. So it, it's a, a very interesting career, uh, especially for a relatively small vineyard and winery because pretty much everybody does everything. So if you want to go out in the vineyard, you know, you're welcome to do that. Um, obviously, growing up with it, uh, you know, has its pluses and its minuses. Um, you know, pluses that we've seen. Um, you know, we've seen every part of it. You know, we've we've been out since we were kids. You know, training all the vines, so we're very connected to the vines. You know, we've seen all the the changes that have gone on. Um, being so close, sometimes we don't always um, take advantage, maybe, of how you know special this area is. You know, people come in and are sort of amazed. It's obviously very smoky now, but they're usually amazed how beautiful it is. We're kind of like, oh well, you know, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> you know, it's the same to us, or how um, you know how consistent our climate is. You know, because we just uh, you know we don't have the challenges of a lot of other growing areas and. Uh, you know, you get a lot of visitors from you know, Bay Area all the way up to Seattle or all around the world who, you know, just love, you know, love this area and, and, and would love to have, you know, sort of what we have here. And after a while that starts to sink in, you realize that this is, you know, there could be a lot worse things to do. Yeah, I was going to mention, we, we used to come back during college and work the tasting room and, and they used to ask us if back then, that we were the only winery or there's only a couple and they would always ask like well what are you going to do after because you see the same visitors year after year what are you going to do after college and i'm like well i don't really know and and they would really be upset like, how dare you not come back here and bring you know, do you know how many people that want to do this and, and as mark said after a while you're like yeah maybe i should do this you don't realize what you have until other people tell you you don't know what it's like out there you, mm -hmm. we all want to come here <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's the dream of a lot of people to work hard enough so that then when maybe they're 50 or 60 years old, they could be doing what we're doing. And it, it's still a job. I mean, we've never, you know, we, we don't look at this, we've never gotten in with a lot of ego or a lot of, a lot of capital, you know, so it's always a shoestring business. We didn't have a trust fund. Um, this was always a business, so to speak. So we, if anything, we don't have the romance in a sense. Uh, that a lot of people do. We, we try to put out, you know, a product. It happens to be wine. We try to make the very best wine we possibly can for the money that people pay for it. Um, but we don't really get tied up in, in a lot of the esoteric stuff that a lot of winery people do. Um, and because of that, we don't charge as much as a lot of people. Uh, you know, we just, we like to, to make wine and sell wine here, ideally. And here, meaning Southern Oregon, you know, most of your friends, most of your, your uh, family, you know, they pay 10 or $20 for a bottle of wine. That's what we'd like to do. We think it's sort of an honor to be able to make wine that people can, you know, generally afford to drink regularly. Yeah, and I love, I love selling wine for people that are going to drink it every day. Right. Cases of wine that they're going to drink every day. It's nice to sell wine for $30 a bottle, but it only is going to happen, you know, they're only going to drink it on special occasions. Um, but we really like, we want to be there every day. And, uh, and 
-hmm. we feel if we put out a good enough product, then we'll have that, we'll, have, we'll, have, we'll be able to make it in the, in the, in the volume, I guess. Right, yeah. right. And if they don't buy our wine, and our wine not just value, but our wine being Southern Oregon or even Oregon wine, they're buying it from somewhere else. And, you know, so we're all losing sales. We're losing, you know, uh, employment, you know, from people working in the vineyards and out through the system. And it kind of gets to be, if, if there's any ego, that's sort of where the ego comes, which is like, well, well, why can they do it? Why are they buying wines from Washington? Why are they buying wines from Spain? Why are they buying wines from California? How can they do it for 10 or $15? Why, what's the difference? You know, our costs are, are every bit as competitive. So um, if there is an ego, it's that, you know, we should, they should you know, if, they, if, if you want a good $15 wine, you should be buying it from, from Southern Oregon, from Oregon. And, you know, if we, we do get pretty passionate about people who, you know, a lot of people in Oregon think of Oregon wines expensive. Maybe across the board, there are many very expensive wines. Um, a lot of that tends to be that that's, you know, people say, I don't want to make $10 wines. I don't want to make $15 wines. Um, you know, we, this is a business. So our, what we found is best with our business is, you know, instead of, trying to sell our wine for people who want to buy $30 wine, which typically are not a lot of people in Southern Oregon, or maybe even not a lot of people in Oregon, I don't want to send our wine around the world. It just doesn't, it, it, it blows the whole sort of sustainability thing that we've, you know, been trying or that we sort of grew up with in Oregon. Um, you know, keep it here, drink it here, you know, and um, when you go to Italy, you drink your Italian wines. <laughs> so that's very fascinating to hear, uh, at least from my perspective. Would you say that's true across the board for Southern Oregon wineries, trying to keep it local, drink local? Yeah, I would, I would say just because of the, most, of the, most of the Southern Oregon wineries are relatively small, and uh, with cost of production, it's very difficult for distribution to go out of the area. Uh, if you're only making 1,500 to even 2,000 cases, you can pretty much sell that within the local area or your tasting room. Um, if you hit Usually four to five thousand cases, you're going to have to be able to go out of the area, and uh, but it's it is difficult. Distribution is the number one, you know, I would say, issue that every winery has anywhere in the United States is the distribution. It's a heavy product. It's pretty well regulated in terms of you know who, where we can sell it. Uh, so, uh, but but the nice thing about our our area is that most of the wineries actually are self distributed now. So they're, they're actually handling all the distribution as well. So um, it helps, because we're self-distributed, we're a rather large winery that's self-distributed. When you have all the other wineries doing the same thing, we don't seem to be as, as odd. And when, when you have a restaurant that wants to go with your wine, you know, you're gonna have to write the check to you and then they're gonna have all these other checks to write. So it makes it easier to be able to break into that. And then it also takes away the power of the wholesaler. It breaks up that monopoly that they used to have over the wine list. They used to write the wine list. They do everything. But once you get four or five Southern Oregon wineries in there, or Oregon wineries in there, and all of a sudden the whole list breaks apart, and they say, well, you know what? We don't even need the wholesaler anymore. You just right. call it. And just we're, direct. And that's a trend that we're seeing every day, that, that uh, a lot of restaurants are just going direct to the wineries, just like they would do with their food. You know? And that is something that is... I mean, it's, it's more in Southern Oregon than it is maybe in even other parts of the state. I mean, I know it's very trendy in Portland and Eugene to have locavore kind of thing. You know, this is where my chicken comes from. This is where this comes from. And it'll extend all the way to the beers, where you go, you go to pretty much any place in the Willamette Valley, and if they've got eight draft beers, at least six are from Oregon, and probably two are from that city, it stops there. It does not extend to the wine list for the vast majority of restaurants, and we've tried to break through that, especially for the uh, ethnic restaurants, Italian probably being number one. You go to most Italian restaurants, and they're gonna either have all Italian wines or the majority of Italian wines, and you just try to explain to them the hypocrisy of that, that if, they, if they're having Tuscan food, and they go to Tuscany, you have specific Tuscan food. You don't have South, Ita Southern Italian food because that's not what they serve in Tuscany. In fact, and if you even, had wines from outside of Tuscany, it would be a surprise, even if they were Italian wines. But if you went to a Tuscan restaurant and asked for a California wine, it'd be interesting to see what the look would have. And yet, they're trying to take that whole concept here, and it doesn't work, and they don't understand that. Um, and most of it is the distributors, 
the idea that they've maybe educated themselves in the Italian wines are not as educated. And a big part of it is, is that the wines run familiar to people and they can make a lot of money on them. Um, and we've, we as our sort of Algonians have to sort of step up and say, I love your restaurant, I love the concept you brought here, um, you know, but you're not getting your chickens from Italy or from France, right. you know, or from Spain, you're getting them locally. So just because you have the opportunity to buy your wines from these countries doesn't mean you should. And so that's sort of the last barrier we have to break down in Oregon is saying you've got to extend it all the way um, to wines. And that will really have a dramatic effect. I mean, if people want to see more vineyards going in, if they want to see more agriculture and value added products, which I think they do, I mean, people would rather see vineyards and houses, then they have to support the industry at every level. And a big part of that is, um, you know, breaking through to some of these restaurants and, and getting them to, you know, sort of carry the local bar movement all the way, you know, including, including the wines and the waters. I mean, I don't want to drink water from Europe. I really don't. I mean, it just, you know, if you want to take it to the extreme, I mean, that's, that's really uh, ridiculous, is drinking bottled water. Um, but it's really no different drinking something that's 87% water, you know, from Europe. In addition to working with the local restaurants on taking local all the way to wine, how else are the marketing strategies different from really trying to buy and sell local to versus the more worldly exporting strategy? So, was it? You're, you're... so I, one of the examples that you guys provided was part of the marketing strategy is really working with restaurants here to encourage them and have them sell local Oregon wine. Right. Are there other efforts or examples of trying to get the word out there, whether it's working with local stores or? Oh, yes. I mean, m most wine in the United States is sold in grocery stores. And the vast majority of that is sold in, in displays, not so much on the shelf, but in displays. So um, we've, we've done a pretty good job of that. Actually, actually I believe we're actually in some instances better in terms of the grocery store at the retailer level than the restaurant level. Um, so we, we've had some really good success, but it's the same, it's the same, you know, issues that come up. I mean, right now it's August 1st and it's Washington Wine Month. And I'm not sure why we're supporting or, or celebrating Washington Wine Month, but every Safeway and every Albertsons that walk in will have a big display of Washington wines. And it's and it doesn't it, it really needs people to start you know when you ask them they they're, they they like oh yeah that's right why would we do that um, we have we have a, <clears throat> we have an Oregon Wine Month it was May that was great because it was Washington Wine Month in uh, in April and uh, and we were able to to grab on that um, you know that you know, having all those Washington wines so, well I hope we're going to do this next month right. and so and we, so we had a lot of momentum going into that so yeah on the on the on what we call off-premise, which is uh, you know restaurants are off-premise and, and uh, restaurants are on-premise and grocery stores are off-premise. Um, we've had really good success. There's a lot more that needs to be done because we still don't have. <clears throat> if if we were able to have 20 square feet of space and and just say that's your Oregon display, um, it would be incredible how much wine we would sell and we would divvy it up ourselves. A lot of times when we're given that space. We talk to each other again because we're all self-distributed now. We would say, "Okay, why don't you put your wine in there? I'll put my wine there." Then halfway through the month, we'll switch. Um, the wineries will work out really well together in a lot of instances, or we'll tell each other if, there, if there's a case stack going low, or we'll sometimes even we'll, we'll merchandise other people's wines for them because we know that they'll merchandise our wines, and then we can double up our our, our efforts in those stores. Um, but it's incredibly competitive. It is incredibly competitive, and um, and we're not given any, you know, in terms of maybe, I would say, maybe a dollar worth of, you know, in terms of, okay, if you have a California wine or a Washington wine, an Oregon wine, if it's within a dollar, they may grab it, but boy, not much more than that. I mean, they're, they're pretty price, people are pretty price driven, but if the wine's in front of them, um, and given the opportunity, they'll, they'll buy the wine that's on sale in front of them, you know, so that's, that's kind of how it works. So um, it, it really does help to work with all those. The independents are doing great, and, um, but even the chains, they, they're given some autonomy, and so we, we take advantage of that. And this is exactly what you would hear from virtually any other winery 
except for maybe the real Eagle wineries in Napa and the Eagle wineries in the Willamette Valley. They won't talk at all like this. They won't talk at all about grocery stores. They won't talk at all about pricing. They won't talk at all about, you know, um, maybe necessarily the collaboration because they're putting their wine on the upper shelf and they're, you know, going in specifically to a restaurant or wine shop and they're trying to get, you know, you know, really trying to go after the 5% of wine consumers. We're trying to go after the 95% of wine consumers. It's just a different market. But like Michael mentioned, the number one thing about the wine industry is distribution and sales. Okay? Now, I would say that no one looking to get into the wine business thinks that's the number one problem. They don't even think about sales. They think about where they're going to put their vineyard, where, what kind of tile they're going to put in their winery, uh, what their label wants to be, and how much they want to charge for their wine. And nobody really thinks about the actual work. Those other things, those are easy. <laughs> Growing grapes is easy. Making wine is easy. Coming up with a label a little bit more difficult. Deciding what, how to do your building, those are easy. I'm not saying they're easy, easy. They're way easier than go actually going out there and trying to sell your wine among four or five hundred wineries just in Oregon. And that is, if anything, you know, if there's a sort of a dichotomy in the Oregon wine industry, that's it. It's those who want to have it as a business and those who want to have it as sort of a hobby. And you would think, well, it's really kind of cool to have an industry based on hobby and ego and extremely well-capitalized people who just are doing it for fun, in essence. It's not really the best, you know, because you end up having people in the industry who don't need to sell their product for more than it costs them um, to make payroll or to pay the bills. And that type of, you know, sort of not really true business, and it, it kind of messes everything up in a sense. Um, because one, it gives people the impression that we all make $125 bottles of Oregon Pierre Noir from, from tiny little vineyards that we play classical music and sing to. And we theoretically actually have $125 in that bottle of wine when those of us who know, you know, you got about four bucks. You know, and that's fine if you have four bucks. If you can sell for 125, good for you. But don't try to tell us that you actually need to sell for 125 dollars. You don't. Um, it's just you know, it's your choice. And congratulations if you can get that that money. If we could, we would. Um, it's just not the way our sort of philosophy is. It's not the way we operate. And you know, we recognize that there's very few people anywhere who regularly spend $125 on a bottle of wine. They're influential. The magazines are all written for them, you know, but, you know, we don't tend to hang around with them a whole lot. You know, <laughs> we don't open very many of those bottles of wine and, you know, it's not, it's not really as much fun. It's more profitable, but it's not necessarily, you know, the, the kind of business that, that we want to be in. So we've learned in 30 plus years, uh, to keep the margins as low as you possibly can because like i said this is a business we have to sell wine in order to this entire building right here was paid for by selling wine um, everything we do is paid for by selling wine so you have to find you know people who are willing to pay you know regularly for your bottles of wine so our margins tend to be low we tend to go direct because there that's a big percentage that distributors take and we tend to go to retailers who likewise have low margins. It's just the natural way that we've sort of worked on. Um, you know, you, you, you hate to get your price all the way down, you know, to say $7 wholesale, which is a pretty tight price, and then see that wine at $25. Right. And you're like, geez, I mean, you know, we're making pennies and they're making multiple dollars. We'd much rather see that wine being sold at $7.99 or $8.99 and have people enjoy the same, you know, the same value that you know we're trying to work throughout the whole system. Are either of you involved in the wine associations in Oregon, like the Southern Oregon Wine Growers Association? Yeah, we're, we've we've done a lot of that. I mean, you know, we were we were in the beginning, so um, I mean, we started groups. So we, I started the Southern Oregon Wine Association. I was involved in all the the wine boards from all the way back. Um, in fact, my dad was involved in the very first, um, I think, associated with the Oregon wineries when I think there was only seven, seven members. Um, and we've been on, you know, all the different iterations uh, throughout. Michael's, you know, started the Applegate Valley Winery Association. Um, 
and we tend to, you know, you can spend a lot of time on that because there's, there's a lot of organizations now and being from the, you know, sort of opposite side of the state, uh, you know, you can spend a lot of time in your car. So I don't, I don't tend to do that. I haven't done that much uh, unless the meetings are, are teleconference or something like that because I really can't drive nine hours for a three or four hour meeting. It just, it's just not, not efficient. Um, and uh, so if, if it's done by teleconference or the meetings are you know, pretty centrally located, things like that. Southern Oregon uh, Appalachian is, is large to begin with, you know, going all the way up to Roseburg and over to Cape Junction. So typically just you know, to go to a quote unquote centralized meeting, it still takes an hour for everybody. You know, so so you're still looking at sometimes a, a full day, um, right. which is a lot of which is a lot of time. But that there's a lot of cooperative marketing, a lot of cooperation um, within the industry, which is which is really good to see. Yeah, we look at our competition as being um, outside of Oregon, you know, not inside of Oregon. As second generation winemakers, how have you seen the industry evolve, especially in Southern Oregon? Uh, I mean, just just unbelievably. I mean, you, we we would not have ever been able to imagine the growth. Certainly, even here in the Applegate Valley. I mean, we were probably one of the last to really be on on board with an Applegate Valley Appalachian, just because at the time it was always you know when we were sort of all of Oregon, it was we got to be recognized. You know, we got to get people to understand that there's wine in Oregon. So we'll get all. 10 or 20 or 30 Oregon wineries to join together and do joint marketing things. Then as, as Oregon started to get larger, it became, okay, we're starting to get a little bit of a dichotomy here because everyone's thinking Oregon's cool climate. Well, we're not really cool climate. There's a lot of Pinot growing down here, but it's not really one of the main grapes. So we want to focus on warm climate. So then it became a sort of a north and south thing where we have to identify ourselves as being, you know, different than northern Oregon, but still who we are. So it became how big is southern Oregon? So it could be all the way up to to Umpqua all the way over to Cave Junction to get as much p sort of power or as much influence as we could from our own state organizations and then out of state as well. And then as it's grown even more, it's, it's become a little bit more segmented. It's become, okay, well now we can talk about, you know, uh, Applegate Valley and, and our area here and our specific uh, grapes that we grow and, and the style that we make. So, so, you know, so we have Applegate Valley, we have, we have Southern Oregon, and then we have Oregon as a whole. You could even say we have Northwest too, but we don't tend to do a lot of joint stuff with the Northwest stuff. Um, so that's been really big to see how that's grown. And now it seems like we have grown to the point where there's so much grapes and wines flowing between each other again that we're back to sort of Oregon again <laughs> and and people understand that there's different sub appellations but so many wineries have wines you know you, you half the fruit in southern Oregon for the last 20 plus years still goes to the Willamette Valley um, as much as it's expanded and grown here it's still going up north so there's still so much of a connection uh, between the whole state of, of fruit that's grown here. There's wineries doing lots of Rogue Valley wines and Applegate wines um, throughout the state. So, and which is, which is great because, you know, if, if you can't grow warm climate varieties in Willamette Valley, it doesn't mean you, you can't make those wines or, or have those wines in your tasting room. And, and likewise, uh, if you, you know, want a cooler climate Pinot or, or Riesling or something like that, or Pinot Gris, um, there's wineries here that, that purchase it as well. So that, that's been really neat to see. So both, both the, the sort of focus on the local area and then you know, the recognition that to a lot of people, Oregon is Oregon. They don't, they don't break it down as much as all of us break it down. You know, they say, an, you know, Oregon wine is Oregon wine. And people in Portland have as much you know, an affinity to Southern Oregon wines, even though we're four and a half hours away, as um, you know, they do pretty much to the Willamette Valley. And we've got to recognize that. And I think people in Portland need to recognize that and take advantage of it instead of just automatically jumping to Washington. Just because Washington, some places are actually closer in Southern Oregon, you're still in Oregon. And, and you know, if you live in Oregon, you know it's Oregon. You know, you drive right across and you're a different state and it's a different mindset. But no matter where you are in Oregon, Oregon wine is still Oregon wine. And there, there's people want to support it, and um, we're 
trying to explain that all the way through, you know, all the way through the system. That's one of the questions we've been exploring with this project. We were up in Roseburg uh, beginning of June, and for Umpqua, it's Land of the Hundred Valleys. Is it Land of the Hundred Varietals? The Willamette Valley seems to hang its hat on one varietal, Pinot Noir. Right. Right. Is that necessary to have a varietal identity, or it is? It is to get to that five percent of the wine consumer, because that five percent of the wine consumer reads Wine Spectator and Wine Advocate, and is really, you know, this is their second life in many events. Really, the people, the people that when most people say a wine connoisseur, you know, they're really referring to that real sliver, and. Then you have this vast group of people who regularly drink wine, enjoy wine, who will be the first to say, I don't really know much about wine, but I like it. And those are our customers. Not that they don't know much about wine, because in reality, they really do know a lot about wine. They enjoy wine. Um, but they're not, it's not their life, you know? It's just, it's, it's enjoyable. To those people, they have no interest in Willamette <laughs> Valley Pure Noir. It's too expensive. It's too variable. They don't want to have to deal with the fact that, is this a good vintage, is this not a good vintage? If I spend $30 on a bottle of wine, will I get a, a good value? Maybe, maybe not. Is it going to go through a bad stage? You know, who knows? I mean, so they've moved on. And most of those people in Oregon, too. In Oregon, generally doesn't drink a whole lot of Oregon Pure Noir either. Um, because it it's, has those sort of challenges and stuff. To the 5%, they love that challenge. I mean, you just have to watch sideways. You'll, you'll pick it up immediately that these people, you know, are gladly willing to spend $50 a bottle of wine over and over again, knowing that half of them aren't going to be very good. Well, most people I know, they spend $50 a bottle of wine, they're going to be really disappointed if it's not really good, let alone, you know, you know not good. So, in most parts of the world, you can get a good solid bottle of wine for not a whole lot of money. And that sort of comes back to what we talked about earlier. I think people deserve that. It doesn't mean that you can't have the other end, but I don't think we should focus our entire industry on sort of that esoteric sliver of people. Um, they can sort of be up there, great, we have that high-end wine. But, you know, everybody talks about Napa Cab and the Colt Wines and everything, but they're, they're sort of, you know, in their own spot. Um, but, but, you know, California as a whole, good solid wines. That's, I think, the formula we need to look at. Same with Washington. You know, you can talk about Leonetti, you can talk about, you know, the Colt Wines that are, you know, 75 or, or more uh, dollars a bottle. But, but what do most people think about? Columbia Crest at $10, you know. Uh, St. Michelle, you know, great, good value wines. Um, Oregon hasn't had that, and we're hoping, and we need more of it. We need more. And you could say, well, part of it's the cool climate, part of it's the lower yields. That's all true, but, um, you know, you can still have, I mean, A to Z has shown, you can have a good, solid $15 Oregon Pinot, and their success has shown that there's a market for it as well. It's just come, in a sense, it's come backwards. You know, you know, most industries start out with sort of your, your good everyday wines and then go to the high end. Oregon sort of got the reputation relatively quickly um, for sort of the, the esoteric stuff. Um, and what I think all of us need to recognize is that, you know, the, the, when, when we go to Wine Spectator, their, their response for 20 plus years has been, we'll, we'll do a story or we'll focus on you when you decide what variety you do best. And for years and years, we always talked about that. What variety is it going to be? You know, it started out as Cap, then it went to Merlot, and then it was Syrah, and maybe now it's Tempranillo. And in the last, say, five or so years, we've all just recognized it's not gonna happen. It's just not going to happen. There's too much diversity here. There's, and why not? I mean, the way, way I look at it, it's like teaching an art school and saying, here are the two colors you can use. And we say, oh gosh, we just found 25 different colors in this box, and I'd rather paint a painting with those 25 colors. You know, I don't want to paint with just two colors. And that's, what, that's what's exciting about Southern Oregon, is that you get people here who just say, you know what? I, I had these great Albarinos, and this is a similar climate to where they're growing in Spain. I want to do Albarino. I want to do Malbec. I want to do Tempranillo. I want to do five clones of Tempranillo. I want to, um, you know, do Chenin Blanc. I mean, if there's anything about Southern Oregon that we try to get people to know, pretty much any variety in the world will grow here. 
um, even side by side with other varieties. And the wine media, you know, the reason why they want to do that is, to, is they do want to pigeonhole us on one or two varieties because it's easy for them. It's difficult to write about Southern Oregon because there's so many different varieties, but it's easy to say, okay, Washington, Merlot, and Cap, Northern Oregon, Pinot, and all the, the Appalachians in California does one or two great varieties. Um, but for us, what's great about this is that we really don't need the media that much now with, with social media and the number of wineries we have and, the, and the, the, the lifestyle magazines that want to come up and just do articles about the wine country here. We really don't need to be driven by a varietal. We need to be driven by an experience and just, oh, and the wines are good across the board and you're going you're gonna to experience a lot of different varieties that you never got through in Oregon or you have got varieties from one, you know, the, the, the diversity of climates here is, is amazing. Going from one vineyard to the other, whether it be your proximity to, to the ocean or your elevation change, you can have um, going from Burgundy to Spain quickly. So, yeah, we, it's for us, getting an article in Sunset Magazine is way more important than getting an article on the Wine Spectator because that's our customer. You know, our customer comes and can go to three different wineries and try 12 different varieties. You know, that's a big plus. Um, and they enjoy that and they enjoy the fact that, uh, you know, we're, we're, you know, you're often gonna be having somebody who's been working in the vineyard, some in the winery, and somebody has a hands-on approach and, and um, you know, is not going to, you know, quiz you on, you know, we don't, we don't talk about clones here. We don't talk about what yeast we use. We don't talk about what the pH is or the TA or all these kind of things. We all know that information. I mean, it's important information. It's not information to us that the customer needs to know in order to enjoy our wine. And I think a lot of people re enjoy that because it is intimidating. Wine is a very intimidating product. And we're really encouraged by, you know, sort of the, the, the younger generations just saying, you know what, I like it. I just, I like what I like, and I don't care what you say, and I don't really care what score it got, I don't care what medals it wins, um, I like it, it fits my price range, and I'm going to open it and enjoy it. Um, very few of, you know, of the generation, you know, the new generation are what I call wine fondlers. Most of the people in the wine industry, especially in the Willamette Valley, and I don't mean to just bash the Willamette Valley, but are, they sell the wine fondlers, which are ex virtually exclusively men pretty much 50 to however old they are, and they get their value of just fondling their bottle of wine in their wine cellar and looking at it and touching it and holding it and reading the score about it, reading the review. They don't get the value or enjoyment from opening it, which is why they almost get disappointed when they open it. Um, they just want to go in there and talk to people about their, their collection of wine. Well, it's not art. You know, you can't get you know, the art's on the inside. You can't get the value, you know, you get the value of painting by looking at it. You get the value of all the wine by opening it. Um, we don't really, you know, cater to that crowd. <laughs> we don't, you know, that, that, you know, we, we, they'll buy our wines. They'll put them away in, in many cases. But like Michael said earlier, we want that person to take it home and enjoy it because we want to make more wine and we want to sell you more wine. And the only way we're going to sell you more wine is for you to drink more wine and, you know, instead of just putting it in your cellar. So it is a bit of a different philosophy, um, maybe not as much north versus south, but um, like I said before, business versus, you know, hobbyist, um, you know, because there's certainly hobbyists in, in our area as well. Um, it is an expensive business to get into, so it's a lot of capital, a lot of time, so, you know, you know, if there is a part of the state where you sort of have, you know, entry-level wineries, Southern Oregon is sort of the place to go, you know, because it is, you know, the, the land's less expensive here, and you have a lot of um, opportunities to do different things, you know, because of the climate. Right. So, what varietals do you two dabble in, and how has that changed since when your father first planted? Well, the first 12 acres, to a certain extent, was uh, very widely planted because we, we wanted to see what would grow well here. We had an idea of what would grow well, but we wanted to make sure. So we actually gave an acre to the Extension Service to plant uh, 12 different varieties. But the, the bulk of our, our, um, the rest of the uh, 11 acres, the rest of the 12 acres, was Cabernet Sauvignon, um, what we believe is Petit Syrah, which, which turned out to probably be Petit Syrah, but we also did Gewürztraminer. My dad was really into Gewürztraminer. A um, little bit of Riesling, uh, Pinot Noir, a uh, little bit of Merlot, and Chardonnay. 
and um, in the second ha half, the 14 acres that was planted in 1976, it pretty much was Cabernet, Merlot, and Chardonnay, those three varieties, which, which became sort of our main varieties. Merlot was sort of the, at that time, uh, the variety that nobody knew about. I mean, people called it Merlot back in the 70s. Um, so that was, you know, it was traditionally used to blend, but we, we, we came out with a varietal Merlot in 1979, which was one of the very first uh, Merlot labeled wines in the U.S. And we, I mean, people had no idea what it was. And there was, I mean, you know, now people see varieties, new varieties, and they just don't think twice. But back then, it was, it was pretty unusual to have, you know, a new variety. And we had to do a lot of explaining to say what Merlot was. Uh, but Cabernet, Chardonnay, Merlot, um, Gewürztraminer as well. Uh, we made sort of some big changes in the 90s. We replanted and regrafted some of the original vines and some of the other areas and, and put in some new vineyards. And the big one was Syrah, uh, which is still, you know, a, a major variety for, for Southern Oregon. And, um, and then in the 2000s, we added Viognier and Tempranillo, which are, are major varieties for us, both in our vineyards and then in our winery as well. Um, Viognier is the only white we grow. All the Chardonnay is now Viognier. Um, we do make a lot of Chardonnay, but it's all purchased. And um, Tempranillo has become the main uh, red that we do, uh, and multiple different clones uh, from vines that are you know, a year old all the way up now because they're grafted onto vines that are uh, 36 years old. So some of the oldest uh, Tempranillo vines uh, in, in America as well. And those, those, are, uh, uh, those are sort of our big you know, varieties. We still do you know, a lot of small varieties, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Syrah, uh, a little bit of Sauvignon Blanc, fair amount of Chardonnay, um, some dessert wines. Uh, Cabernet Franc a little bit. So, it, you know, we, we, we go back and forth to putting out, you know, many varieties to putting out fewer varieties. Uh, to a certain extent, things we do in our taste room with our wine club, we, we have a, you know, pretty good confidence that if it's a good wine, it doesn't matter what it is. You know, we can, we can sell it here, we can sell it to our wine club. Um, I, don't, I don't have much um, problem anymore planting new varieties. Um, as long as I know that it'll it'll grow and ripen well here, those are those are obviously the, the keys um, and make a good wine. And it's always better to grow what grows best as opposed to growing what's popular and trying to force yeah. it. Um, as Mark said, you know we can make if it was up to us. I mean, we have the and Tempranillo. Those are pretty still pretty esoteric varietals. A lot of people still don't know about them, um, but they do so well here. Um, and we do such a good job that um, we can, we can. I'd rather have those wines than trying to make a more popular wine that may not fit our climate as well. Because Viognier is not the easiest grape to grow or make. <laughs> yeah, but it is. You know what? What we you know we went from being you know different than the Willamette Valley because we're way drier or way warmer to then recognizing that, okay, that's true, but on the other hand, we're also in a, in, a, in a microclimate of the Applegate Valley, which is still a little bit cooler than Medford, a little bit more rain, and it, it ripens, you know, a little bit slower. So, you know, among the warm climate varieties, of which there's many, uh, those that lean a little bit more towards the cooler end, like Viognier and Tempranillo, do better than, say, Cabernet Sauvignon and Syrah. Um, and it's just that little bit of a tweak where, you know, Viognier and Tempranillo do well here pretty much every single year. Cab and Syrah, two out of three years. And that's enough to where you're like, okay, well, you know, you know consistency is, is really important to us. We don't want to have to say, you know, well, it's a little cooler this year, you know, and, and you sort of have to, have to change. I mean, every year is obviously different in the wine industry, but um, those varieties, you know, are the best sort of combination for us of obviously they, they grow they grow well, they ripen, you know, consistently here um, at, at relatively lower sugar levels, which is kind of a personal style of ours that we really don't care for, you know, super high alcohol wines, super oak wines. Um, and that, that style seems to, you know, have, have a, it's now sort of become a little bit trendier than it was, say, say 15 years ago. Um, but people like the fact that our VUNA is 12.5% alcohol, not 14.5% alcohol. They can enjoy it more as the, the kind of flavor that they like. And, um, 
and we we tend to like it. it's a little bit more true to true to style. They like the fact that our Tempranillo is a little bit lower alcohol, not heavy duty tannins, not heavy duty brand new oak. We can certainly do it that style. I mean, certainly the oak is is easy if you just write a big check. Um, it's not the kind of style that um, I think is best for the kind of wines that we make here. Um, the, the kinds of wines we make are, are and, and it's not, we're not, when we sort of say us, we don't just mean Valley View, sometimes we also mean Southern Oregon. We do tend to make a little bit more, you know, f what they call fruit forward wines, as opposed to oak forward wines. <laughs> and a lot of that's economics, you know. Uh, oak barrels can be very expensive, and a lot of people, um, you know, want to show what the, the region is, show what the fruit does, as opposed to just putting it into the same barrel that everybody else does. and. Uh, you know, trying to fight through all that oak. So what are your two respective roles here in the winery? Michael tends to do more sales, um, management of the tasting room. Um, I tend to do vineyard and some of the, you know, wine blending, although Mike comes in there as, as well. And then we do, you know, together we would do, um, you know, deciding on, on wines. Um, in terms of bottling and blends and things like that. Myself more from the production quality kind of standpoint and then he more from the um, sales part. Like for instance, you know, right now we've got a, a pretty good lot of um, 2011 Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, we could do either two, a Merlot, a Cab, and a Claret, which we do tend to do a fair amount of. So deciding, I guess, how much to do of each of those three that's where I'm gonna, you know, Mike, Michael come in and say, well, you know, do we want it? Do we want to put the two together and make a big claret and add some cab franc, or you know, where where does claret stand as opposed to varietal cab, varietal merlot, um, and you know, then we'll put together the very best of those, you know, three wines. But uh, that's more where you know this um, lean towards, you know, what what do you think sales wise? Where do you think claret is? You know, I mean, it's it, it's obviously a Southern Oregon creation to a certain extent. Um, it's something that we do well, but you know, 300 cases or 15 our cases. That those those are sort of the decisions that you make. Um, you know, you're going to go. You know, will we get be able to get it statewide in Costco and need 15 our cases or not? Uh, or would they rather be more in cinema or lower cap? So, so those those type of things. You know, there's a lot of you know sort of flexibility in in some of the things that we do. Could you tell me more about your father? Mm -hmm. what? And especially what he was like in the industry. I know that's a, a different perspective as young children, perhaps. Yeah. But. Well, you know, I, I was 12 when he died, so I just remember him mostly just as a dad, not so much, you know, as a in the industry itself. Um, you know, he was a civil engineer, so so it, uh, the the wine industry was just probably half of what he did. He was also had jobs all over the place. So, um, but I remember. Still to this day, there's people that, that, that remember him, and, he's, and he died 33 years ago. And there's still people come up to us in a store, and I remember your dad, he was a great man, and all this. And so that's kind of cool because I never, you know, was not really old enough to experience from that point of view. Um, but yeah, he, it was a big loss. Um, he, was, he was involved in a lot of different um, uh, activities in terms of um, his planning. And, uh, and I'm sure he probably would have been tapped as probably something to run for something at some point. But, uh, but it's still nice to have that. People come up to you and say, yeah, I remember your dad doing this. And, and um, he used to, I think what we get from him was we don't. Um, no is not really the answer we want. We always we're always striving for something else. And the whole um, when we when we talk about self distributing, um, we are, we're we're breaking ground that, and we didn't realize this in the beginning, but we are breaking ground on. We're the only Oregon winery that goes direct with Trader Joe's, and uh, and one of the few that goes direct with Costco. So um, we don't know if that's just we're crazy and it's not going to work or it's something that we you know we just happen to be the first or it's, it's a trend but um, I think that's probably what we get from him the most is that uh, now there's a better way of doing it there's another way of doing it we don't have to do it just because everybody else does it that's, that's yeah the tradition I mean I think which is somewhat unique in Oregon or even the west coast I think a lot of people chose to leave the east coast probably all the way back the last 150 years 
left because they were looking to do something new or get away from sort of a, a traditional structure, whether it was a family business or, or whatever. Um, certainly, I think one of the things that maybe attracted him to the, the West Coast and, and even to Oregon and even to Southern Oregon was, you know, you can do, you can do anything here. It's a very independent uh, area and this is a very independent business. And even though, you know, he, he was only here, you know, eight years and only really in the business for four, um, like Mike said, I mean, you know, people still, you know, you know, we grew up thinking, well, that's just the way it was. I've now come to realize that that personality was, was really one of a kind. I mean, you just don't have people who choose to put in a vineyard in a winery where there are no vineyards and wineries. Um, you know, even in this sort of independent business, you still look at, you know, say, say you look at Oregon, or say you look at the Willamette Valley, people put in Pierre Noir because their neighbor puts in Pierre Noir, because that neighbor put in Pierre Noir, because that neighbor put in Pierre Noir. And they put in the same clones, and, they, and if you start looking at, at leaf thinning or some practice, and you ask them, well, why are you leaf thinning? You know, you get this sort of blank look, like, because they're leaf thinning over there and over there, and I figure somebody must know that that works well, and I go, that's not a good enough answer for us. We're like, no, I kind of need an answer better than why you leaf thinning because your neighbor's doing it, or why do you cropping the two tons an acre? Because that's what they said is best. Really? And you, you never really thought at any point to take three rows and crop it to three tons or three and a half or four tons and see what happens? No, never thought about that. And I'm kind of like, wow, we, we are different, I guess, because we do that continuously. We are constantly switching from cane to cordon, leaf thinning, not leaf thinning, trying different trellising methods, trying different cropping methods, trying different irrigation systems. Um, with, of course, an eye always to, to Davis or Oregon State or whoever and trying to glean as much information as other people are getting, um, you know, looking at extended maceration, looking at native yeast versus cultured yeast, um, different oak treatments. I mean, it's like that's what really, to me, was so exciting about the wine business. I can go down to Napa, I'm going down tomorrow, and I can go and talk to wineries or winemakers, and they're as interested in what we're doing as as you know what we've learned as as I would be interested in what they've learned it's all trying a better way and um, I don't accept just my neighbor does it so so that's why you know that's why we do it so we're always gleaning information we're always trying to find a different way of of finding success and um, you know I guess that's not as common as as we grew up to believe um, I just thought that's just the way everybody does it, um, you know, but uh, so that, you know, whether we got that from our dad or whether it just, you know, being so forced into, you know, growing up with, with, with what, it, what it was. But yeah, he was, um, you know, I mean, he came here and immediately got interested in land use because he saw, you know, what, you know we came from New Jersey, okay, the most densely populated state in the United States. He saw, you know, people could take advantage of this, and was was very involved in immediately in, in you know in protecting farmland, um, which uh, you know he was he was you know he was a strong capitalist, but he believed that you know there should be farmland, there should be residential land, there should be commercial land, and um, you know he 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 was a lot of people really valued that he had you know strong opinions and was very clear and he was an engineer so he was very practical in a sense and uh, and was able to uh, get involved very quickly in, in managing how we would you know deal with the future you know of our farmlands where nowadays people look at these rules and you know sometimes they're inappropriate sometimes they're strict but in general I think people would agree that that they would rather see you know something grown on the best farmlands you know, and put the houses on, on some of the poor lands than, than vice versa. Mm -hmm. Well, that was the formal set of my questions. All right. What questions should I have asked you, or is there anything else that you wanted to share with us? Um, well, I just think uh, the other thing, well, what I would what I said with, with working with Mark, um, or having two of us, especially with all the other wineries around, um, it really shows we have a we have a, a pretty distinct advantage because 
in most wineries, they have one person who's the general manager or the owner, but by having both of us, um, and both having over 20 years experience, it, 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 it's quite uh, it's quite advantage because Mark will come up with some idea, um, and I'll just say that's crazy sometimes. <laughs> but uh, but we'll, we'll look at it, and sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, but it's the same thing, you know, he, he kind of pushes me to do things differently, and uh, oh, we can do this, we don't like, oh no, I can't do this, well, okay, I'll look into it, and then we'll, it, it may or may not work out, so. Um, but I always say, you know, you know, some of the wineries that they only have one person, they don't, they can't bounce ideas off of somebody yeah. else, and and get to some conclusion or, or think about something. It's just, it's just so nice to be able to say, okay, so what do you think about doing this? What do you think about doing that? And um, and, and be able to kind of hash it out, whether it be in the winery or the vineyard. Or here. Right. And we 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 tend to do things now quicker, a shorter turnaround time than we used to. Um, probably because we are getting older. So, and then the other thing is, is that you start to recognize, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. So, you know, had we say grafted over this five acres five years ago, we would have fruit now. So, we do tend to, I think, jump on things a little quicker than we used to, um, instead of just trying to, you know, sort of pound that square peg in a round hole. It's like. Let's just try to find a round peg, you know? I mean, we're already swimming upstream enough. So, you know, like it came back, do we want to, you know, do we want to make a claret and try to push it into the system, you know, and try to say, you need to put a claret, you need to put a claret? Or do we just want to make a cab and Merlot and say, here's a cab, here's a Merlot. They're both really good wines. We can get on the wine list with, with Cab Merlot instead of having people explain what Claret is and all that kind of stuff. You know, th those type of things I think we recognize, um, you know, going with the flow in a sense, I don't necessarily think it's compromising, it just tends to be, you know, just sort of a more organic type of way of doing something instead of trying to just trying to force your way onto somebody else. You know, if, if somebody wants, you know, not that we do it typically, but if somebody wants a wine with a little bit of residual sugar, if somebody wants, you know, uh, you know, uh, a, a, you know a, a blend or anything like that, I mean, what, what, what should our opinion on wine matter that much? <laughs> We're not the ones necessarily, we, we make about, you know, 4,000 times as much wine as we can drink. So we've got to sell it. And, you know, it, it's sort of the height of ego to me to make wines that just you like or your particular style. You really do need to try to satisfy the people who, you know, want to buy your wines. And so that's what we're constantly trying to do, you know. We may eventually go back to Gewürztraminer, or who knows? You know, we, we don't say never anymore. We used to say we'd never make Pierre Noir. We don't say never anymore. Um, you know, it's just, I don't, I don't think we'll be making blush anymore, because, but that's one because it doesn't sell. It just has not sold. It's a very difficult wine for us to sell. If, if things change, we'll be, we'll be right on it. We'll be making rosés or blushes like everybody else. But, I'm, but we're not that interested, I think, anymore in, in paving the road. Um, we've done enough of it, you know, in a sense. I don't mind now just sort of traveling down the road that, that other people have cleared. Um, you know, making uh, collectively three or four thousand cases of Viognier and Tempranillo in Oregon, and so and having to sell that every year, you know, that's a lot of paving. That's that's a lot of, you know, pushing pushing through. It'd be nice to just sort of go with it, go with the flow kind of thing, enjoy it, and and you know, go to what. You know, like I said before, the, the, the easy part, the growing the grapes, the making the wine, all those things that actually aren't that easy, but they are easier than having to sort of try to sell a wine that nobody knows about or has ever heard of. And we're always, we're always getting more information with our, with, now that we're self-distributing, we have so much more information now on what the, from just our, our experiences and, and how to sell wine, who's buying the wine, and everything from the vineyard through the winery, through the sales, it's not that we have an answer, or we just have a better answer. We're getting, I don't think we ever, we, I think we've given up on trying to find, oh, this is it. It's yeah. more of this is, this looks to be better than it than we're doing. And we're, I mean, we've changed almost virtually, we had 26 acres, I think we've changed 20, almost all of them. 
well, pretty much all of them. Yeah, in three years, we'll, yeah. we'll have yeah. almost and turn the entire thing around 100%. Yeah. Not necessarily root-wise, because in many cases yeah. we're grafting, so we still have 40-year-old vines, but the tops are different. Yeah. New varieties, um, new clones, you know, sometimes same variety. We've, we grafted the last one acre of our original cab back to cab. I don't know if anyone's ever done that before, grafting Cabernet to Cabernet. But, you know, I, I could rip it out. I just can't rip out the original vines that, you know, I planted when I was eight years old. And it's, you know, four rows. Um, but on the other hand, they, they've just become just, they were too un, un, unwieldy. Um, they, were, they really weren't producing hardly anything. It was just growing green leaves. And now we'll totally refresh them, be able to have a, a better trellising system. And, um, you know, they'll, they'll be, they'll be much more productive, which, you know, and still, and still have the fact that they have 40 year old, uh, roots. So they'll still have the, the sort of the best of both worlds. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of a, a neat thing to, to see and recognize that it's still sort of the old and the new, in some cases, of one plant. Um, and, and you certainly see that in the winery, you know, it's, it's a 150 year old pole, pole barn with old equipment, new equipment, you know, but everything sort of here is sort of a working winery. It's all designed to put out, you know, the best possible bottle of wine we can at the best possible price. Um, we don't have Italian tile. We never would have Italian tile. This whole building here was built, you know, with a local architect, a local builder. The windows came from Portland. That's as far away as any of the products came. And that was deliberate. We we're like, why would we possibly bring in you know, hardened clay from halfway around the world. To me, that's, that's, it's not just insane, it's, it's, it's wrong. It's wrong on every single level. You know, if I see, if I see, and I'm sure I'll see a lot down in Napa, but I'll sure you see a lot even some places. If I see it, if you tell me that your taste room is made of Italian marble, that to me is, is just like, I'll just practically walk out. It's just like, well, are you, you know, are you just, are you an idiot? <laughs> I mean, why would you bring something that heavy from halfway around the world? And for that matter, why would you necessarily get your glass from, from Europe, you know? I mean, it's sand and, and electricity, you know? I mean, get it from the closest place. Get your fruit from the closest place. Um, you know, we, we were sustainable before anybody knew that word. And it wasn't necessarily it was just the way you had to be, you know? We, we don't bring up, uh, you know, truckloads that are empty. We, we always bring up full trucks because it's the most efficient. And in many cases, we piggyback with an empty truck from another Oregon winery. Um, yes, it's sustainable, but it's also a lot cheaper. It's just economical. Um, it, it's a lot more economical to buy glass, you know, from California than it is from Europe. Um, and again, you know, it's not, I don't, it's not the ego. It's more economical to use the lightest glass you can find, not the heaviest glass. We've never had a heavyweight bottle, ever. Uh, why? It's not the bottle, it's what's in the bottle. So you're going to buy a bottle that's twice as heavy? You know, go look in Napa, feel those bottles. Go look at these high-end Pinot Noir part people, twice as heavy. So you're paying twice as much for the bottle, generally, twice as much to get the bottle to you, twice as much in freight to get the bottle to the distributor. It's, and then you've got it all the way through the system. And if you ever talk to the sommelier in those restaurants, they hate it. They won't buy, many cases, bottles of Napa Cat and Oregon Pure Noirs if they come in heavy bottles. They can't determine how much is left in the bottle. They can't decide when you're pouring for a table of four people how much wine is left. They hate it. So it's just like, if nothing else, listen to your customers. You know, not, you know, listen to the people out there. You know, or they'll say how sustainable they are, and then they'll have this really heavy bottle that is probably the, you know, usually glass is probably our number one. Obviously, we're not consuming the electricity that's consumed somewhere else, but um, when they're creating these bottles, and at the same time, oh, we're, we are sustainable in well, that's great, but you're using all this energy to create a bottle that, that's so heavy, it doesn't need to be that heavy. Right. And it's just, it's just, um, yeah, it's it's a lot. It's a lot heavier. I mean, it's just right. it's a pretty amazing. And for, and for that pounds. matter, it's why we're continually searching for the best American oak that'll fit our needs. Uh, we don't look at it again as I mean. I look. Yes, we can spend a thousand dollars on a French oak barrel. It's just writing a check. Anybody can do it. Uh, I have a problem with that. It's wood growing halfway around the world. What's the deal? Yes, it's a different. It's a different flavor component. But it's also a flavor component that, again, a small sliver of the population is familiar with. 
the vast majority of people are totally acceptable with you know the best quality of American oak that's you know 60% less expensive we carry that all the way through you know so that you know when people say well geez how can you sell this really good bottle of wine for $14.99 it's like because of all the above <laughs> because of every aspect because we're very competitive because we you know our equipment's you know already paid for because Nobody was foolish enough to loan us money back then, so everything had to be paid for with cash. So we don't have interest payment. We don't have mortgages. You know, you know, we don't. You know, you can't pay cash. You, you know, you can't afford it, which is what our parents told us. Which, being business people and being business, both of us are business majors. That's not an easy thing to swallow because in the business world, you borrow money. You know, if you have a good idea, you can borrow money. You know, we came from you know pretty conservative economic people. You said you know, if you can't afford to pay for it, then you can't afford it, and. Maybe recently people have started to recognize that and say, oh, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world. It's not the worst thing, you know, to say if you can't afford your, your house payment, maybe that's too big of a house or maybe you don't need a new car all the time. Um, so it, it does fit what we've done here. And I think it's, you know, just the fact that we, you know, people say, you know, how's everything going? And after a while you say, you know, we've, we've been making wine for, for 36 years and there is no trust fund so after a while you start to say must be doing something I mean <laughs> we're, we're we're making it we're growing it we're selling it through the system I mean uh, you know so after what you know longevity certainly becomes uh, some type of um, success you know people say we, we, we're still here we're still here we're still we'll still be here for a while right. yeah. Not that we're going to rest on anything, because we don't. <laughs> we don't. Um. Well, thank you both so much. Thank you. Those were wonderful answers.